Hey everybody, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and as promised, I am recording two different uh, little mini lectures for you to learn about language uh, while I am away at my conference. So uh, we had a fun time uh, talking about different types of um, grammar violations today, syntactical violations, phonological violations, and right now we are still discussing aspects related to phonology. So the last time that we were in class, we were talking about the fact that speech production is really fast and it's pretty complex. And as I mentioned, if you look at a spectrogram of speech in real time, it looks like a long continuous string. There's not a lot of delineation between where one word ends and where one word begins. As a result, for us to understand spoken speech, we need to be able to break that continuous stream into separate segments. This process is known as speech segmentation. And as I mentioned, sometimes our speech uh, segmentation is not perfect and we sometimes end up with the phenomenon of mondegreens. So another big problem with, co uh, with speech segmentation is a phenomenon known as co-articulation. So while speech happens very quickly, your mouth and your jaw and the different facial features that you need to be able to modify your vocal tract, they move a bit more slowly. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is that your vocal tract is basically getting ready. As soon as you've pronounced a phoneme, you are already in preparation for pronouncing the second phoneme. So your vocal tract is already beginning to change shape to make adjustments for that next phoneme that comes in. And what ends up happening as a result is that adjacent phonemes will overlap as we're pronouncing them. So we call this phenomenon co-articulation. Ultimately, what this means is that the B in ball actually sounds slightly different to the B in bill and the B in bell because you are already in preparation for that ah sound compared to that I sound or S sound. As a result, the B sounds slightly different with each different pronunciation. So there's no specific auditory pattern that corresponds to a phoneme. There is not a clear B sound within the context of language. They are going to be different in different types of contexts. So what sort of things can we do to help us segment speech, seg uh, speech signals? So we have a few things. We have things like top-down processes. So we can use our prior knowledge. We can use our expectations. Um, one of the first things that we know is that our daily speech is limited. While you and I, you are capable of knowing a variety of different words, most of us have a set of words that we considerably use more frequently than others. As a result, we already have a pretty good idea of what words we can encounter and what that's going to look like in the context of our day-to-day -day life. Additionally, we use context effects to help us. So if you've ever been in a crowded area and sometimes people are coughing and sneezing and you can't quite get all the phonemes, um, one of the things that we find is that you are more likely to form a phoneme that basically helps make a word. So this is what's known as phonemic restoration. So I wanna give you an example. So um, there was a study that was done where people were presented with a sentence that said, the members of the legislatures uh, convened on the Capitol yesterday or something along those lines. And under certain circumstances, a cough was presented in legis the word legislatures. So instead of sounding like legislatures, it sounded more like this, legislatures. <coughs> now, obviously I'm producing that with my own mouth. So it's gonna be a bit more slow, 
than what you would actually see in a research study. So that cough would be superimposed in the word legislatures, but most people still heard the word legislatures. Now, what was interesting is that if you ask them where the cough occurred, they wouldn't be able to tell you. They weren't quite sure if it was in the first S of legislatures or the second S of legislatures, but what's important here is that they were able to use the context to help fill in the missing information on the phoneme that they needed. Additionally, one of the things that we'll talk more about is that while we can hear a variety of different sounds, so for example, the B in bill, bell, and ball are pronounced differently, we still categorize all of those as B, even though they're slightly different. So while we are capable of understanding a variety of different phonemes and hearing a variety of different phonemes, we are very black or white when it comes to how we perceive those sounds. It's either a B or it isn't. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that categorical perception shortly. So here is an example of that categorical perception. So here I am uh, showing you an example of three different sounds. So we have ba, da, and ga. So let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So ba is formed largely at the front of the mouth. It is based on an obstruction of airflow from the lips. Da, if you sound that out, is further back in the mouth. The tongue hits the roof of the mouth right around the teeth. And as a result, we get a slightly different sound. Ga is in the back. You actually form that closer to the soft palate. So the da is made with the tongue hitting the alveolar ridge in the hard palate. Ga is made by the tongue hitting the vellum or the soft palate that's at the back of the mouth. So ba is at the front of the mouth, da is in the middle, and ga is at the back. What you're looking at here are different sounds that were presented to people and their frequencies. So here's what ba sounds like, and what you're looking at here are three major foments. You don't need to know what those are. Um, major foments for each of those sounds. So here's ba, here's da, and then here's ga. And you can see that they all look different from each other. But what's interesting is that researchers presented sounds that were kind of in the middle. So this kind of looks like ba, but not quite. This kind of looks like da, but not quite. So what's interesting is that these are kind of in the middle. And it turns out that people are either going to characterize these middle sounds as either ba or da. There is no halfway component when it comes to our perception. Um, so what you're going to find is that for some people, this sound is going to be char characterized as pure ba. For other people, it's going to be da. But in general, you're not going to see anybody go, well, it's kind of halfway. No, there is no halfway here, even though the frequencies technically are halfway. A similar process happens with da and ga. Here is the uh, spectrogram for da. Here's the spectrogram for ga. And you can see that there are some halfway sounds that look like da and ga, but are missing some of the major features. And again, people are either going to characterize these as da or ga. They will not pick a middle sound. So we have this categorical perception, and that helps us with the phonology. Once we understand and are capable of segmenting the sound, we are also going to process phonemes, and then we're going to start processing the morphemes. We're going to start figuring out what this sentence or utterance or word actually means. So phonemes ultimately will combine to make morphemes. Morphemes will combine to make words. Now. One of the things that we know that kind of helps us with segmentation further is that some phonemic combinations don't happen in certain languages. So for example, TL, TL, is not acceptable within a syllable in English. So if you hear a T phoneme followed by an L phoneme, that signals to you that you've got a boundary between words because certain phonemic combinations are not permissible within English. For example, MR 
is another one of those. Odds are pretty good if you're encountering that and you know that the person speaking English, you are dealing with a language, a kind of a boundary between words. Additionally, we do have rules to help us adjust our phonemes when certain combinations occur. So for example, when we have the S sound and it's often being used as a plural, um, we are going to suddenly change the S sound to a Z in a word like slugs, bags, rooms, dogs, cheeses, etc. Now, another thing that helps us out when we're trying to identify words or phonemes or morphemes is that you and I have what is referred to as a lexicon. Now, the lexicon is basically an internal dictionary. Um, and this lexicon is not just for, um, for speech, but it also is used when you and I are reading. So this isn't just confined to speech. It's also when we are visually encountering verbal materials, such as when we read. Um, so basically, within this lexicon, you and I have um, not just the words that we use, but we have some additional information as well. For each word, in a lexicon, you're probably going to know the following. You're going to know about its phonology. You're going to know what it sounds like. You're going to know something about its orthography, what the word looks like, and how it's spelled. You're going to know about its appropriate syntax. So if you know that the word is a noun, you know that it's only going to occur in certain parts of a sentence. And you're going to know something about the semantics. You're going to know what this word means. You're going to have a definition for it. So now we're going to move on to issues related to syntax and also phrase structure. So Syntax, as I kind of mentioned before, are words that are, are rules that ultimately govern how we construct phrases, sentences, and different types of utterances. So sentences can actually violate syntax, and we talked about some syntactical violations, and they're still going to be meaningful. Your textbook gives an example of anything that Cookie Monster says. So for example, sorry, I dropped my phone. Ah. Um, anything that Cookie Monster says would technically qualify as um, a syntactical violation, but we still understand the meaning. If Cookie Monster says, me want cookie, um, obviously that's not appropriate syntax, but you know that Cookie Monster wants a cookie. I mean, it's right there in his name. It's Cookie Monster. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, syntax is ultimately separate from meaning. Going back to Chomsky's example of a sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, um, that is syntactically correct. Um, we have our adjectives that are uh, modifying nouns, and we have adverbs that are modifying verbs. So this is syntactically correct, but as we talked about semantically, this does not make a lot of sense. So syntax is often going to be separate from the semantics of the message. And syntax ultimately guides our phrase structure. Phrase structure governs how we construct sentences and the elements of those sentences. So we have rules in our language for how to structure our sentences and the order that they occur in. So for example, phrase structure um, is going to govern how we construct these sentences. So English is what we call an SVO language. That means that our typical phrase structure is going to be a subject, a verb, usually followed by an object of some kind. So she gave him the book. So she is our subject, gave is the verb, and then we have him, that's going to be our direct object, and the book is going to be a kind of our indirect object. But in general, we're going to have sentences that are made of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So here's an example of the big dog chase the cat. The big dog is our noun phrase. We have an article. We have an adjective that's modifying our noun. And then our verb phrase is chase the cat. So our verb is chased. And then the object in this sentence, our direct object, is going to be the cat, which is modified by an article. This is what we call a descriptive rule. So a descriptive rule is how we actually 
use language. And this needs to be contrasted to what we call prescriptive rules, which prescribe how we should use language. So you'll often kind of see this in certain cases. You'll say that you shouldn't end a sentence with a preposition. You shouldn't split an infinitive, those kind of things. Those would be prescriptive rules. Descriptive rules actually describe what people are doing with that language. Now, where we sometimes run into trouble is with ambiguous sentences. Ambiguous sentences can have more than one phrase structure. So the example that I gave you at the beginning of class was, let's eat grandma versus let's eat grandma. Those have completely different phrase structures, but if I don't use proper inflection, you may not know what I'm meaning. So here's an example. The burglar blew open the safe with the dynamite. There's some ambiguity there. Um, so the ambiguity is, did the burglar blow open the safe using dynamite? Or did the safe have dynamite in it? And generally what we are gonna find is that the prepper, that the pref, the preference is that, um, the preference is that the burglar blew open the safe using dynamite rather than the burglar blew open the safe that had dynamite in it. But there are slight differences in phrase structure, and as a result, they can be ambiguous. So here are a couple of other examples. They are cooking apples. Is it they, some people, are cooking apples, or are these apples that are specifically used for cooking? Likewise, I saw the gorilla in my pajamas. Am I in pajamas seeing a gorilla or am I seeing a gorilla wearing my pajamas? These are cases where these sentences have more than one phrase structure. And as a result, they have what are known as structural ambiguities. Now, there are other types of ambiguities that we can have within the context of a sentence. So, for example, words themselves can be ambiguous. This is a case of what is referred to as lexical ambiguity. So if I say I'm going to the bank, do I mean the financial bank or do I mean the river bank? So now with the nine, eight minutes that we have, we're gonna talk a little bit about the biological roots of language. So I talked about this very early on in class and one of the things that I tried to forward is that humans are unique in that we are the only species that is capable of producing a language. Now, one of the things that I mentioned and one of the things that you should be thinking about is yes, other animal species do communicate with each other, but is it a communication system or is it actually a language? So when we talk about language, there are a couple of things that we need to have that separate language from a mere communication system. So let's talk about what those are. So first of all, words carry meaning, but they're arbitrary. What this means is that I call this a bottle. I could very easily, so we know what a bottle is. If I tell you, go get the bottle, you will go get it for me. But you could very easily imagine a world where a bottle could be named something else, but it could still be useful. So words often will be arbitrary. Now this isn't always true when we talk about something like a laptop computer, like a laptop, uh, but then you'd have to focus on, well, what does it mean to have a lap? Could I mention that this could be something else? Sure. So words carry meaning, but they're arbitrary. Additionally, we use language to communicate displacement in time and in space. We can talk about things that we are not present for, we can talk about past events, and we can talk about future events. We don't talk just about the here and now. Additionally, as we already talked about, the units of language are discrete, so they're kind of their own separate entity, but they're productive. So let's talk a little bit more about these. So first, let's talk about the properties of words, the last point that I started with. Um, so the relationship between words and meanings are arbitrary, and we know that in our language we do this. Um, now, if you compare this to spe other species, 
Um, generally, other species, this is going to be nonverbal, but they are not arbitrary. Dogs only bark under certain circumstances, and those barks carry very clear meanings that are not arbitrary. If a dog growls at you, a dog is telling you to back off. That is a very clear instance of a communication that is not arbitrary in nature. Now, what's interesting is that there are some species of monkeys that produce warning calls. For example, the vervet monkey. And what's interesting is that some of those calls are arbitrary in nature. So for example, a dog barking or a dog growling is not arbitrary, but a particular type of call that a monkey has might carry meaning that is not like obvious. So for example, a monkey might have a warning call for a panther, but it doesn't sound specifically like a panther. That would imply that it's arbitrary. Additionally, we have displacement in time and space. We need to be able to talk about things oops, that are not physically present to us. So human language contains, um, oh, there we go. Language isn't solely about our present place and time. And that's what's really special about our language. Now compare that to other species. Those monkey warning calls are not discussed at a later point, and they are not necessarily focused on the future. So they are specifically bound to place and time. Now we also know that honeybees do what is called a waggle dance to indicate where sources of pollen might be. And what's very interesting is that if you actually look at those waggle dances, they are arbitrary and they do indicate displacement in time and space. They can talk about pollen sources that are not directly nearby. And then finally, we have discreteness and productivity. So we know that human language contains discrete units. We have letters, we have phonemes, we have words. The question is, do other species communication systems actually have this? The bee waggle dances do not. They don't have discrete units, but monkey warning calls do. You can actually combine different types of calls to respond to multiple different predators in the environment. So all of this is to say that while some species have communication systems that look very much like language, none of them really meet all three criteria to qualify as language. Having said all of that, there is a very well-documented history of researchers trying to teach apes and other primates to learn language. Very early attempts failed horribly. So I am going to share with you the case of Gua. This comes from Kellogg and Kellogg back in 1933. Kellogg was a researcher at the University of or Florida State University and up until very recently the psychology research building where I took many of my classes uh, was named the Kellogg Research Building. So I'm going to read this to you. History contains numerous accounts of children raised by animals. The children in such cases often continue to act more animal than human even when returned to human society. The psychologist Winthrop Kellogg wondered what would happen if the situation were reversed. What if an animal were raised by humans as a human? Would it eventually act like a human? To answer this question, in 1931, Kellogg brought a seven-month-old female chimpanzee named Gua into his home. He and his wife proceeded to raise her as if she were human, treating her exactly the same as they treated their 10-month-old son, Donald. Here you can actually see the image of Gua and Donald, both being dressed like human children. Donald and Gua played together, they were fed together, and the Kellogg's subjected them both to regular tests to track their development. One such test was the suspended cookie test, in which the Kellogg's timed how long it took their children to reach a cookie suspended by the string in the middle of the room. Gua regularly performed better on such tests than Donald, but in terms of language acquisition, she was a disappointment. Despite the Kellogg's repeated efforts, the ability to speak eluded her. 
Disturbingly, it also seemed to be eluding Donald. Nine months into the experiment, his language skills weren't much better than Gua's. When one day he indicated he was hungry by imitating Gua's food bark, the Kelloggs decided that the experiment had gone far enough. Donald evidently needed some playmates of his own species. So on March 1st, 1932, they shipped Gua back to the Yerkes Primate Center, and she was never heard from again.